The Jim Rome Show, weekdays at 10, Sports Radio 610, the sports animal. Back inside the sports bar, 610, the sports animal, Michael Carlisle, Mike Trujillo. All right, we'll get back to the phone calls, tweets, emails coming up in just a bit. Joining us now, as he does pretty much every week at this time, it's our good friend Michael Lubomov, GM over at Jackson Wink. Michael, how are you? Hi, how are you doing, guys? How's everything? Doing very well. And uh, you've got uh, the, the good doctor with you as well? Oh, yes. We have Dr. <laughs> Bo Hightower over here, one of our uh, leading uh, doctors here at the yeah. team. We couldn't have done it without him. He's right here. He's going to say hello. All right. Uh, hey, doctor, great I... to be with you guys today. Yeah, man. Good to talk to you. So uh, how does one become doctor to the stars, doctor to the athletes here in town? Well, I think if you just do a good job and you stay with it and uh, – your name starts to get around pretty quick, and if yeah. you take care of people, usually these things take care of themselves. So I've been blessed to, uh, you know, be able to work with these fighters and everybody else. And and once they start doing better, they send it, they send their friends in, and we get more and more of those folks uh, trusting us with their health. I got to be honest, Doctor H. I'm a little intimidated with this interview. I don't think I've ever talked to anyone in the top one percent society. Uh, Mensa, dude, <laughs> what the heck? <laughs> how, how did you get so smart? <laughs> I don't know if it's a smart thing or somebody that just got really lucky at taking tests, but hey, I'll take it. <laughs> You've got what three Bachelor of Science degrees uh, in biology from UNM, Bachelor of Science in anatomy, health and wellness, uh, dude. Uh, you to talk about yes, b- b- putting your all into something. Hey, exactly. You know, some <laughs> people own houses. I just have a lot of letters after my name, so you know, you, you, you pick and choose, I guess. Yeah, and for those who don't know, uh, you also played uh, football for the Lobos, right? You were a linebacker. Yes, sir. I played for uh, Rocky Long back in the early 2000s, uh, mm-hmm. you know, some of those bowl teams. So it was, a, it was a great experience. Nice. Now, how did you wind up being a team doctor for Jackson Wink? Well, long story short, uh, we, I moved here about three and a half years ago. I've had practices in Ohio and Texas and a few other places. Mm-hmm. Uh, we opened up our practice, and a couple of the fighters, Diego Sanchez in particular, Carlos Condit, started coming down, um, and they introduced me to Coach Winkle Johnson when he started to put together the plans for this new mega complex. Mm-hmm. You know, it's basically the mecca for fighting gyms in the country. What they wanted to do was make it a very advanced place that had things that other gyms didn't have. So one of those would be a healthcare provider on site. Um, so we went through, you know, a couple interviews. He basically asked me a question, trying to see where I am philosophically. Uh, Coach Wink is a very straight shooter, and so he's checking to see, you know, are you somebody that's going to mesh with our philosophy? And one thing led to another, and, you know, from that day I've been able to uh, help these guys get to the fights and, and do the things they like to do and the things they make money doing as well. Dr. Hightower, Mike Trujillo here. Uh, t- tell us everything that encompasses uh, elite orthotherapy and sports medicine. Yeah, so basically we're just taking the best practices of any kind of physical therapy, chiropractic, one of the techniques that we have is called napropathic medicine. I actually teach at a napropathic school in Santa Fe, um, so Southwest University of Napropathic Medicine. And what they are, they're, they're experts in connective tissue. So one of the things we're evaluating here on a day-to-day basis are overactive muscles and underactive muscles. So if we get somebody balanced, meaning we strengthen the muscles that are too weak and we loosen up the muscles that are too tight, generally speaking, they're going to feel a lot better. There's bony alignments, we fix those too. And then we have to assess, obviously, for things that we can't necessarily fix so we can get them to the right person, so say fractures or dislocations or things like that. So, you know, being that first line of defense really helps um, over-medicalizing some of these injuries so people get pulled a lot of times when they don't necessarily need to, when it's not as bad as they think it is. But, you know, getting that first line of defense allows us to tell them, is this something you need to go see a surgeon for? Is this something you know need to go, you know, get antibiotics or whatever for? So if it's simple, we fix it. If it's more complicated, then we refer out, and, and it's been a great partnership so far. We're talking with Dr. Bo Hightower, by far the smartest person to ever be on this show, and he is the team doctor <laughs> uh, over at Jackson Wink. Uh, Dr. H, for most regular people, you go to the doctor when you're sick, when you're hurt, when you're injured. When you're dealing with athletes and people who compete at a high level, how much is does preventative maintenance go into uh, – dealing with athletes to keep them from becoming injured in the first place. Right. So this is a conversation we have a lot of times in the office. We like to use a dental analogy. So think about the hygiene that you take care of, hopefully, right, hopefully, Mm -hmm. for your teeth and your gums and everything like that. We're brushing and flossing, hint, hint, twice a day. Um, You know, you're washing your skin. You're taking a shower, hopefully, again. It depends on who we're talking to, I suppose. (laughs) But, you know, 
essentially we're trying to get people to say, take a look at their muscular system in the same way. So, mm-hmm. you know, an ounce of prevention goes a long way. If you keep your muscles loose in the long term, again, five minutes in the morning, five minutes in the evening, whether it's stretching or foam rolling or, you know, doing the right strengthening exercises to keep your body healthy, you're going to go a long way to avoiding disability, avoiding surgeries, and avoiding all kinds of other costly and damaging things down the road. What's it like when you have to finally uh, put the kibosh on on an athlete and tell them, look, there, this is a condition that you're not going to be able to go on and, and, and either fight or play anymore. What's that conversation like, and uh, how often does it happen? I mean, I'm, I'm guessing a lot. Yeah, I mean, those are heartbreaking situations, and it actually doesn't happen too often, but when it does, I mean, they need the truth and they need it to be straight to them. So there are certain injuries, particularly when you're talking MMA. These guys are really tough. These guys and gals, excuse me, are really tough. There's certain things that they're going to fight through. I mean, this is the way they make a living. So, you know, if they've got a rib issue that isn't enough that's going to sideline them, that's just pain, they need somebody to tell them, hey, listen, you know, it, 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 you know your tolerance to what you can train for. But the thing is, is if they don't show up and fight, they don't get paid. If my back hurts, you know, I can still come to work. I can still do my thing. If you guys, you know, say your shoulder's bugging you, that doesn't stop you from making a living. But with these athletes in particular, that can stop them from, you know, feeding their kids, essentially. Um, so we're going to do everything possible to help them do their job. Now, like you said, when the time comes, if you've got a torn ACL, if something's fractured, we had a, a young lady that kept breaking her hand over and over again, and she would come up, and I think she knew that it was, and she's crying, and, you know, it, it's a real situation where we say, listen, you need to see a surgeon. If you don't get this handled now, it's going to make it a lot harder down the road. So, I mean, those are very, very emotional and difficult conversations to have, and obviously we, you know, we hate to do it, but sometimes it's necessary. Dr. Hightower, there's a lot of talk in sports in general these days, concussions, concussion symptoms, uh, the the long-term effects of suffering concussions. Obviously, in a high-impact sport like the the world of MMA and boxing, uh, that's something that's dealt with quite a bit. Uh, And what has changed, say, in the last two, three, four years as far as what people look for when it comes to concussions and treating people who have concussions and, and monitoring them and determining when they can resume practicing, sparring, and, and fighting. Right. So the the awareness has, has really changed mm-hmm. the game a lot. People aren't having more concussions, even though they're being diagnosed with more. People are just more aware of concussions, and they're you know I think it's a good thing overall that we're taking preventative steps to assess people. Most high school teams have somebody on the sideline that has been trained in concussion protocols to be able to pull somebody out when we see those symptoms. Now, it's a tricky situation because, again, we don't really have enough hard information in the long-term studies. We know that CTE exists, and we know that some of the symptoms um, are physical. But there are some people, again, Frank Gifford, we've had some Mm -hmm. other folks that it seems like when they find another avenue down the road, we don't tend to see those same symptoms manifest as somebody that they have their whole life taken away. Like, say, an NFL player that's been the, the hero since he was 10 years old. And then he retires at 32. So you're not only dealing with physical trauma, but also, you know, identity loss, identity crisis, and and other things. So it's really uh, multifactorial. So when we're talking about concussions, um, some of the things that have really changed, again, are are people are putting in those uh, those, those evaluation protocols. You know, they're taking away people's helmets. And you're seeing it in the NFL and college games. Um, And hopefully, you know, we don't know if it will or it won't, but hopefully, you know, we have the right intentions and this will pay off down the line with um, somewhat less CTE. Mm -hmm. One more thing I wanted to ask you about, and this probably is a, a little more MMA-related as opposed to just sports in general, but a lot of talk um, in the last several months about weight cutting and changes being made to that. Um, obviously, a few weeks ago, uh, Chris Cyborg um, went through a lot to, to make weight for her fight. What kind of potential damage is a fighter doing to themselves when they have to go to extreme measures to, to cut weight uh, to, to make a fight? Yeah, so there's a few things that can happen. Obviously, the most blatant one is going to be kidney damage and kidney stones. Mm-hmm. Um, we've seen fighters have to go to the hospital because they've, they've cut too much weight, and they basically dehydrate themselves to the point where their kidneys don't function properly. So, when we, you know, when you're evaluating, we try to do a good job of helping folks out here, uh, dropping good weight. So, you're, you know, a gallon of water weighs about 9 pounds. Most fighters can generally manage a 10- to 15-pound weight cut okay. Mm-hmm. So if you come into fight week and you're 20 to 25 pounds over and you still have to make that weight, um, odds are you're having to dehydrate yourself to dangerous levels. And what we're seeing is people getting heat, di- you know, heat stroke because they're in the, the hot tub for too long. You're seeing people, um, the other big risk, again, is if your brain doesn't rehydrate or overhydrates after you, you know, put the water back in your system, you are at risk for more brain trauma and more of a concussion. So okay. generally speaking, obviously nutrition and conditioning comes into it. But, you know, if you can get somebody within 10 pounds of their weight, 
usually they can fairly safely cut that weight. You know, 10 pounds is not too much, depending on the size of the person. Obviously, if they're 105, it's a lot worse than someone who's 215 or 220. Um, but there are some serious health risks to it. And I think that the fact that they moved the, the weigh-ins up a little earlier in the morning so that people don't have to go through that the whole day right. is a helpful measure. Um, you know, when you're talking about weight class sports, it's always a tricky situation because everybody's always going to try to game the system. So other than having them weigh in right before they go in the cage, um, you know, the best thing we can do is try to keep things as safe as possible by giving them enough time to rehydrate um, and hopefully giving them some sort of uh, nutritional and, and water-cutting guidance. Is there more that could be done? Should, should the organizations look into more weight classes or anything like that? Or do, you, or do you think that maybe this is something that gets talked about a little too much sometimes? Yeah, I mean, I, you make a very valid point. Sometimes in these weight classes, like the women, for example, you have two weight classes. You have 135 yeah. and 115. But well, clearly women come in a lot different sizes than 135 and 115. Yeah. Um, so when you're basically trying to force some of these larger women to cut down, and we saw that with Cyborg as well. So in a perfect world, yes, more weight classes is, uh, certainly would be the best bet. In the men, you see a 155 and a 170 and then a 185. And, and those are pretty big differences there. So, you know, if you're an ectomorph, a mesomorph, an endomorph, whatever morph you are, mighty morph and power rangers, um, <laughs> it depends on <laughs> kind of where you are on that. But, you know, mm-hmm. obviously a bigger, more muscular guy or gal is going to have a harder time making that. So in a perfect world, again, we would have more weight classes. Unfortunately, you know, the companies that run that are, are in charge of making it a financially viable situation, and they call the shots. Oh. Uh, Dr. Hightower, I wish we had more time to, to talk with you. This has been uh, utterly fascinating. Uh, appreciate the time so much, man. Very informative stuff. Hey, we totally appreciate you having us on. And, uh, you know, again, thanks to Michael Lubinoff and Jackson yeah. for continuing this, this program. I think it's a great thing for Albuquerque. Yeah. I think it's a great thing for the gym. Absolutely. And uh, real quick, Michael, but before we let you go, I've gotten uh, several messages over the last couple of weeks, people wanting to know uh, how to access the online store, or what hours they can go by over at the academy to the, uh, the the gift shop there. Give everybody that info real quick. Uh, definitely, yes. You can go to jacksonwinkstore.com, jacksonwinkstore.com, mm-hmm. and pretty much purchase everything that we sell in store downstairs as well. And then uh, the store is open um, Monday through Friday, uh, 10 a.m. Uh, to 2 p.m. Gotcha. So Monday through Friday, uh, everyone's welcome, and uh, we'd, be, uh, we'd be happy to to have you rocking all gear. Perfect. Uh, but Michael, uh, yeah, but appreciate it so much, man. Anytime. We'll see you next week. All right. Take care. That's Michael Lubomov and Dr. Bo Hightower.